Hey, Abbott, what time is it? It's time for the Abbott and Costello Show. We're on the air for ABC here in Hollywood. Well, what are we waiting for? Let's go with the Abbott and Costello Show. <laughs> yes, it's the Abbott and Costello Show. Produced and transcribed in Hollywood for your listening and laughing pleasure with Chuckles with a Carload. Music by Matty Malvin. So hold on to your chairs, folks. Here they are, Bud Abbott and Lou Costello. All right, all right, all right. All right, what's all the excitement about? What, 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 what happened, Lou? Well, Uncle Mike discovered gold on his ranch. Well, good for Uncle Mike. Yeah, he's sending to Europe for some Englishmen with shovels. It, he's sending for Englishmen with shovels? What for? He figures England will want to borrow the gold sooner or later, and they might just as well come over here and help dig it up. <laughs> oh, let's face it, Costello. Your Uncle Mike is a moron. Oh, no, he's not. No. He's going to be a great sci scientist someday. Right now, he's working on a new insecticide. The... He is? Yes. Last week, he got out of his notebooks and locked himself in his laboratory with 10,000 mosquitoes. He released the mosquitoes and was going to write down the mosquitoes' behavior. Then what did he write? Nothing. He was so busy scratching, he didn't have time to write. <laughs> Just as I thought. He's as big a nincompoop as you. No, he's not. Right now, he's crossing a rubber plant with a banana. What does he expect to get? A girdle you can slide into. <laughs> You know, your whole family are jerks. <laughs> but by the way, what was that silly-looking thing on the uh, radiator of your car this afternoon? Well, you see, I can't afford a radiator cap, so I trained my little dog to sit on the radiator. <laughs> your, your dog sits on the radiator? Mm -hmm. D does he bark much? Only when it boils over. I... <laughs> You know, Abbott, <laughs> I got a job as a babysitter. You a babysitter? Yep. <laughs> Babysitters are girls. Well, uh, what's wrong with the man? My Uncle Jim Kelly was a sitter. He isn't around anymore, though. He isn't? What happened? Uh, while he was sitting, the warden pulled the switch. Oh, get him out. <laughs> and there'll be much more of that terrific Abbott and Costello humor in a few seconds. <laughs> so excited about calm down what's the matter i'm worried Abbott. what do you mean my, my aunt may is in terrible shape well, what's the matter with her she's got hallucinations <laughs> she thinks she's a taxi cab <laughs> she thinks she's a taxi cab yeah why doesn't uncle mike call a doctor why should he she gets him to work faster than the sunset bus <laughs> <laughs> how long has uncle mike and aunt may been married lou well it's just 20 years since they went on a honeymoon Aunt May went to Niagara Falls, and Uncle Mike went to Miami. Wait a minute. You mean they weren't together on their honeymoon? No, Uncle Mike said that a honeymoon is the happiest time of your life, and why let marriage spoil it? <laughs> well, it's wonderful to think that your, your Aunt May and your Uncle Mike have been married for 20 years. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but really, Abbott, what's wonderful about it? Uncle Mike thought she loved him, but for the whole 20 years she hated him. Hated him like poison. And now they have 17 children. Wait a minute. 
She hated him. Why did they have 17 children? Well, it was her idea. She was just trying to lose them in a crowd. <laughs> that may uh, mean to him, Lou? Well, <laughs> she beats him up all the time. He wouldn't mind it if it wasn't for the children. The children? Yeah, they beat him too. Right. <laughs> he must be really henpecked. Yes, he is. She tries to keep him in the house every night. Saturday, when he started to take his bath, she put six boxes of jello in the tub so he'd get stuck. Luckily, it was raspberry, and he ate his way out. <laughs> well, I don't have a very happy home life, do they, Lou? No, no. Saturday night, Uncle Mike played pinochle all afternoon, and when he came home at 6 o'clock, there was no dinner on the table. Well, where was your Aunt May? Down at the bowling alley. She's down there seven days a week. Well, that's a shame. Yep, Uncle Mike should have never got her that job setting pins. <laughs> Well, look, uh, wasn't your Uncle Mike married once before? Yeah, but his first wife passed away. Well, now, that's too bad. Uncle Mike had such a tough time collecting the insurance that sometimes he almost wishes she hasn't died. <laughs> what did your Uncle Mike do before he got married, Lou? Well, he was quite a Romeo Abbott. For two years, he carried a torch for a girl in Pennsylvania. He carried a torch for a girl in Pennsylvania? She was a coal miner, and it gets pretty dark in those tunnels. <laughs> Didn't he ever work for a living... Sure, he had a job in a canned soup factory. He was in the chicken soup division. He was a dragger. Now, wait a minute. What are the duties of a dragger in a canned soup factory? Very simple. When a 1,000-gallon tank of hot water was ready, he'd drag a chicken through it. <laughs> well, it's no wonder your Aunt May fights with Uncle Mike. Yeah. You should have seen Aunt May Sunday night, Abbott. She was so mad at Mike that she said she was going to pack a suitcase and leave him forever. Now he's really worried. He is? Yep. She ain't even started to pack her suitcases yet. <laughs> what a couple they are. Mike isn't a bad-looking guy, but I can't see what he ever saw in your Aunt May. She was very popular in Patterson when she was a young girl. She was? Yes, the Patterson Electric and Power Company voted her Miss Alternating Current of 1915. <laughs> Costello, that's about the year you were born back in Patterson, isn't it? Yes. I'm Patterson's favorite son. What do you mean? Just last week, the people of Patterson erected a statue in the very spot where I was born. The spot where you were born? Where was that? Right in the middle of the Greyhound bus depot. <laughs> you were born right in the middle of the Greyhound bus depot? It was raining and my mother couldn't get a taxi. <laughs> I tell you, you talk like an infant poop. Tell me, does your whole family suffer from stupidity? Indeed not. They enjoy every minute of it. I... <laughs> Hey there, Costello. I want to talk to you. Mister, do I owe you any money? No. Mm-hmm. Did I ever give you a tip on any of, any of my horses? No. Have you got a red-headed sister in Chicago? No. Okay, go ahead and talk to me. <laughs> <laughs> you give away prizes on this program. Can I win a refrigerator or something? Nope. Well, goodbye. I've got to go hurry over to the gangbusters radio show. Last week, I got $164 on that program. Uh, 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 wait a minute. Gangbusters don't give away anything. Oh, I forgot to tell you. I'm a pickpocket, too. <laughs> now I know where I saw that guy, Abbott. It was the 30th anniversary party. Yours. Remember you had a swimming pool filled up with bourbon? Yeah, the whole swimming pool was filled with bourbon. What fun. Yes, I never saw so many people going down for the third time with smiles on their faces. <laughs> Well, never mind that. The whole town is talking about my anniversary party. Uh, didn't my wife, didn't my wife Betty look beautiful? I, I'm very proud of my wife. Every man in town was fighting over, but I got her. Abbott, you didn't fight hard enough. <laughs> my wife is a beautiful woman. She hasn't got a wrinkle in her face. Uh, she hasn't, huh? Then what are those things? Dents? <laughs> Costello, you don't know nothing about women. I don't even know why I even discussed the subject of women with you. Well, it's not my fault, Abbott. Uh, I led a very sheltered life. <laughs> then I met a lovely little redhead, and I learned about women from her. You did? I'll never forget our first date. We sat on the riverbank in the moonlight. She moved closer to me, then I moved closer to her. Then the moon went behind a cloud. Then it happened. Why? She let me tighten a string on her ukulele. <laughs> Did you kiss you, Lou? Yes. Uh, did, you, did you like it? Oh, boy. Uh, how, how did it make you feel? 
How does it make me feel? Yeah. Did you ever stand on a hot buttered waffle and have somebody pour maple syrup down your spine? <laughs> How did you get along with her, Lou? Oh, good. The second time we had a date, I took a sightseeing on a bus. Uh, rubberneck? No, but I tickled her a little. Right. Boys. Hey, look, Costello, it's our secretary, Viola Vaughn. Well, Viola Vaughn. That's my line, Lou. Take it. Well, Viola Vaughn. <laughs> I understand you bought a new car. How do you like driving in California? Well, well it would be. That's it your would be. explanation. <laughs> it would be all right if it weren't for the pedestrians. What's wrong with the California pedestrians? <laughs> well, I was driving down here tonight, and one of them whizzed right past my windshield. The dirty coward was pole vaulting across the street. <laughs> Sneaky devils, ain't they? <laughs> Viola, why don't you take me for a ride down the beach tonight? I should say not. Ah, Costella, Viola's only kidding. She, she really likes you, but you've got to do something to show that you like her. That's right, Costello. Do something brave. Do something brave? Uh -huh. I know what I'll do. I'll join the army and help fight the British. But we're not fighting the British. That's all the better. That way nobody can get hurt. <laughs> Costello, you know, you've been acting kind of queer lately. Hey, wait a minute. Come to think of it, you're right, Viola. Yesterday afternoon, I saw him sitting up in a tree in Griffith Park. Costello, what were you doing up in that tree? Signing autographs. Uh. <laughs> Signing autographs? Yes, the Robins thought I was Woody Woodpecker. <laughs> <laughs> Costello, here's another thing. Why, can, why do you always carry an umbrella on your arm? Why don't you get a girl on your arm? You know, a girl is much nicer than an umbrella. Oh, I don't know, kiddo. When you're through with a girl, can you fold her up and hang her in a closet? <laughs> Why, you simple-minded, no-good, low-down... No, 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 I, no I, just I, a minute, Mr. Abbott. Uh, Have you ever stopped to consider that Costello's reasoning capacity and his functional capabilities for logical delineation are coordinated, comprehensive, and negligible? Is it, is it compulsory to you to abuse this poor, moronic, social incompetent simply because the poor slob doesn't possess the mental capacity of an imbecile? But the only... Just a minute, Abbott. <laughs> You've had this coming to you for a long time. Let her finish. Continue. <laughs> oh, what a slob I am. Viola, I... Hey! Viola, I can't help it if Costello is stupid. Who's stupid? I want to say something, Abbott. I'm always studying, always reading. I just finished a book called When Frankenstein Meets the Wolf Man in Dracula's Garden where the spider woman killed the cat girl. <laughs> What's the story about? Two bums living in the La Brea Tar Pits. <laughs> well, I, I've got to go now, boys. I'm taking my painting lessons. Do you paint? Oh, yes. I draw birds with charcoal. I paint flowers in watercolor. What do you do in oil? Fry potatoes. Come on, <laughs> You know, Abbott, there's a girl going places. She is? Yes, sir. And if she hurries, she can be the first one in line to collect her unemployment insurance. I'll get him out. Now, while we get the 50-second intermission, we'd like you to consider this. <laughs> Thank you.
is, ladies and gentlemen, that singing star of the Abbott and Costello show, Hal Winters. I'd like to sing a song that belongs to the month of January as much as White Christmas belongs to December. With Matty Malick's orchestra, here is the Ralph Ranger, Leo Robin, perennial, June and January. <laughs> I just made an important discovery. I think I, I can safely announce that Governor Dewey will run for president in 1952. Oh, what makes you think that? He just started taking piano lessons. I... <laughs> you know, Costello, ever since you started playing the part of Sam Shovel, private detective, you've got your nose in everybody's business. You've been as busy as an ant. Ants are busy? Certainly. Then why are they always going to picnics? I... <laughs> Will you talk sense? Hey, what, what is that letter you have in your hand? Well, Abbott, it's another fan letter. Listen to this. Dear Lou Costello, a Sam Shovely detective, you are the greatest thing on radio. I love your show. But my wife won't listen to it. She says she needs you like she needs a hole in the head. I'm sending her to see you tonight. Mm -hmm. Mr. Costello, there's a lady to see you. What does she look like? She's, She's a, a short, fat, fat woman with a hole in her head. Oh, never mind, huh? What is your Sam Shovel detective story for tonight, Luke? I think I'll do one of my old Western cases. I call it the case of the general who opened up a drive-in and was caught selling horse meat or Custer's last hamburger stand. <laughs> well, now you're talking. Let's do it. <laughs> I'm Sam Shovel, private detective. I remember my first case. Three-eyed Maxie the murderer. He had three eyes. He was the only man in the world with 20-20-20 vision. <laughs> and there was my second case. Terrible Tony, the toughest gangster in Los Angeles. He was a bronze giant with muscles of steel and an iron fist. I had to shoot him. May he rust in peace. <laughs> Fifteen years in the detective business takes a lot out of you. But I feel as strong and vigorous as the day I started. Right now I could tear Superman in half. But I don't want to ruin the rest of the paper. <laughs> oh, 
I feel kind of thirsty, I go to the sink. This Los Angeles water is getting harder every day. I... I glance out of my window. There's the headquarters of the Republican Club. On the window, there's a sign, GOP. I just found out what GOP means. Gone out permanently. I look down at my desk. There's my new wristwatch. My new wristwatch. It's a shockproof, non-magnetic, waterproof watch. The directions say don't take this watch out of the box. Fresh air ruins it. <laughs> I think I'll give it to my secretary. What a secretary. She got the job the hard way. The hard way. She knew how to type. <laughs> Lying next to my watch is my shotgun. I decide to see if it's loaded. I point it at the floor and pull the trigger. I look down at the floor. Mm hmm. When did I buy open toed shoes? <laughs> I reach in my coat pocket. Here's a wallet I found last night. I hope I can find the owner. I check, I check to see what's in the wallet. Here's a card. If it's found, return to Mr. Nichols, Delmar Hotel. Here's a driver's license issued to Mr. Nichols, Delmar Hotel. Here's a birth certificate with the name Nichols. Here's the pink slip for a new Hudson sedan issued to Mr. Nichols, Delmar Hotel. Well, here's $600 in cash. Looks like I'll have to keep the money. Serves that guy right. He should carry some identification. <laughs> Name on the money is Washington. <laughs> now, let me see. Oh, yes. It's about time for my pal, Lieutenant Abbott of the Homicide Squad, to show up. Abbott had a pretty tough week chasing crooks. Monday night, he was held up on Main Street. Tuesday night, he was held up on Broadway. Wednesday night, he was held up on Sunset Boulevard. If Abbott would stay out of those saloons, he wouldn't need anybody to hold him up. <laughs> <laughs> Lieutenant Abbott don't have to work. He was born with a silver spoon in his mouth. This was okay until he found out that all the other kids had tongues. <laughs> it's not easy to be born with a silver spoon in your mouth. Up to the time Abbott was 19, all he could say was Rogers Brothers, 1847. <laughs> Before he became a detective, Abbott was a motorcycle cop. He was the only cop on the force that had traffic eyes. Real traffic eyes. They'd always look both ways before crossing each other. <laughs> no matter what case Lieutenant Abbott goes out on, he's never stuck. Hello, Sam Shovel, private detective speaking. Hello, Sam. This is Lieutenant Abbott. Sam, what time do the vaults open in the Fourth National Bank? At 9 o'clock tomorrow morning. Not till 9 o'clock tomorrow morning? That's right, Lieutenant Abbott. You can't get in those vaults till 9 o'clock tomorrow morning. Who wants to get in? I'm trying to get out. <laughs> Suddenly, my door opened. Sam. Sam, Sam Shovel. It was my pal, Lieutenant Abbott. He was scared to death. He was perspiring. <laughs> he was sweating bullets. <laughs> Lieutenant Abbott, how'd you get out of that bank vault? Sam... I'll tell it to you all in a nutshell. Can't you tell it to me here? I don't think we'd both fit in a nutshell. <laughs> Sam, I've been working on a series of bank burglaries. Monday night, the Kelly gang held up the First National Bank. Tuesday, they held up the Second National Bank. Wednesday, they held up the Third National Bank. So tonight, 
I was waiting for them at the fourth national bank. And you caught them? Nah. Tonight they held up the first national bank again. <laughs> but enough about myself. Enough about my trouble, Sam. Sam, you don't look good. What's the matter? I didn't get any sleep last night, Lieutenant. A burglar climbed into my bedroom window and made me get out of bed. <laughs> I stood there shivering in my long underwear. Why didn't you holler for help? He had a gun, and I was afraid to open my trap. <laughs> After the burglar left, I still couldn't get any sleep. I was worried about my brother Pat. He kept poking his head into my room. Well, lots of guys poke their heads into their brother's rooms. On the end of a stick? I... <laughs> Did you hear those shots? They came from the office next door. Who rents that office next door? An organization called the American Society of Patriotic Americans for the Preservation of Freedom in the United States of all and for all patriotic Americans. What do they do? They're foreign spies. I... <laughs> Sam, Sam, look. There's the guy that did the shooting. He's coming in here. He's got a gun. Ah, so this is the place I've been looking for, eh? Where's Sam Shovel, the private detective? What do you want with him? I'm going to kill him. I hate radio detectives. I hate them all. The Tin Man, the Fat Man, Elroy Queen. But most of all, I hate Sam Shovel. I'm going to gouge his eyes out. I'll fill him with lead. Now, who are you? Oh, I'm just an ordinary police. Yeah? Honest, mister, I'm not a radio detective. And you? Who are you, fatso? <laughs> well, uh, I'm, uh, um, you know, it's, um... I'm the um, don't stand there, rabbit. Hand me my cookbook. <laughs> cookbook? Who are you? Don't you recognize me? Mary Margaret McBride. <laughs> oh, oh, so you're the one that gives out those recipes, huh? Mm-hmm. Well, if there's anything I hate worse than radio detectives, it's those recipe programs. I'll kill them all. I'll, I'll kill them like a hell. Hell. <laughs> Our show will wind up tonight's high pinch in just a moment, plus, after a little advice from this fellow. Are you sure the folks at home like the Sam Shovel series we're doing? Oh, certainly, Abbott. Listen to this letter. Dear Lou Costello, other radio detectives get you to listen, listen, expecting something big on their shows. Then in the end, they have nothing. You never disappoint the listener. You have nothing right from the start. <laughs> well, now, that's quite a compliment to our writers. Oh, sure. And I'm glad they heard that fair letter, folks. Because our writing staff is headed by Eddie Foreman with Paul Collin, Pat Costello, Martin Ragnall, and Leonard Stern. And our producer is Charles Vander. See you all next Thursday. Good night, folks. Good night, everybody. Good night, everybody. Good night. Listen each Thursday night at this time for another great Abbott and Costello show, produced and transcribed in Hollywood. Be sure to stay tuned for the outstanding entertainment which follows throughout the evening on this ABC station.